Hey Dave, how you doing today? I am doing fine, Nick. How are you? Good. Happy Podcast Friday. Winter is Here back. Here we are. It is, but the sun is out. That's it's, right. Uh, it's uh, not looking too bad out there. It's cold today, but hey. I'll take sunny and cold versus mild and gray any day. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit of a mood lift. Yeah. So today's topic, Dave, is about the all-important risk tolerance. You want to tell us a little bit about what we mean when we say risk tolerance? Yeah. So risk tolerance, um, big subject and comes up all the time when we're working with clients. But, you know, the way I like to put it to clients is your risk tolerance is that weird psychological point in in your own personal makeup where you're going to like look at a statement or look at your account online and call me up and say, I can't take this anymore. We have to do something different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my, that's my like everyday working definition of a client's risk tolerance. Right. And that's an, it, it's interesting because as we've seen, you know, that can be a moving target. And a lot of times clients, um, there's a lot that goes into risk tolerance, right? You know, if, mm-hmm. if things are going well and everything seems great, people tend to have a have a higher risk tolerance than when the market's been down, right? For sure. So trying to get at what that real risk tolerance is can sometimes be a trick. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think too, it changes over your lifetime, right? Like different situations. Yeah. yeah. In your you can, life, you can be. You can be much more tolerant of risk if you understand the markets. You're 25 years old and you're saving for a retirement 30 years down the road. Uh, When retirement is two years down the road, your risk tolerance may feel quite different. Um, Not for everybody, though. I've seen that, you know, sometimes that doesn't change as much because there's also an experience and an education component to it. Right. Um, It's not uncommon, you know. 25 year olds today were in their early teens during the financial crisis and watched their parents go through all kinds of angst over that. We've just gone through a really bad year where some beginning investors really got bit for a, for a number of reasons and don't have the, um, you know, 25 years of market experience to be like, oh yeah, you know, last year we were down 12%, but you know, I know that's just temporary, right? Right. So, so education, experience, where you are in life, all play into this. Yeah, I think that's a great point you made too about like the twenty-five-year-old, the the twenty to thirty-year-old. Really, their only experience a lot of times with the market is two thousand and eight, right? Like that's what they right. remember about the stock right. market is things went really bad in 2008 and you probably shouldn't trust it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like that's like they're, and, and um, we don't talk about it as much anymore, but I'm sure you experienced this too when you were in the bank, Dave. And that is that greatest generation that lived through mm. the great depression mm-hmm. and their views on the stock market were oh. formed around growing up and, you know, not trusting banks and right. not trusting markets. And, and, and there was, there was a lot never of enough cash and there was never, right. yeah. never enough safety for some of those folks. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, in, uh, you know, I went through the, um, the, uh, behavioral finance and, um, financial therapy curriculum at Kansas State. And a lot of it was talking about how early we, they, you know, the technical phrase for it is money scripts. You know, mm-hmm. those, those early experiences can be so formative in how you think about money. And in this case, how you think about markets and risk. Yeah, for sure. Big impact on, on people's yeah. outlook and, and how they view these things. So, in in kind of, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about today that we do with Mm -hmm. our clients, Dave, and that is um, we create an investment policy statement for them. And part of that is assessing their risk tolerance. And so, um, when we're talking about risk tolerance for clients and assessing it, it's important as advisors because we want to know, like, you know, what your risk is, how you think about risk so that we can mm-hmm. help work with you on certain categories and certain aspects of that. 
Um, so that's important from, from an advisor standpoint, but it's also important from an investor standpoint to really understand like what you're comfortable with, what you're not comfortable with, right. what your overall attitude towards risk is. And um, to establish like a common language between us, mm -hmm. right? Because I can say things like, oh, you're in a moderate growth portfolio and your ears might say, oh, moderate growth. That means, you know, low, like what, what's moderate to you can be completely different from what the industry or what I think of as moderate. Right. And so we need to kind of peel back that subjective language around conservative, aggressive, you know, let's quantify that. What, what is, what is a, when you, when you say you want to be, you don't want to take more than moderate losses, what does that mean? Is that 5%? Mm -hmm. Is that 10%? Let's put it in dollar terms even better. If you've got a $500,000 portfolio, is 50000 okay to lose? Right. Is 100000 okay? You know, wh where, what does that really mean? And yeah, so really what an investment policy statement does is takes the client's risk tolerance score. And then another aspect of, of risk is what we call risk capacity. And I mm -hmm. tell clients like every time, whenever we're doing a financial plan, we're figuring out what your risk capacity is. How much right. risk can you take? How much risk do you need to take to make the plan work? Right. And at what point is it so much risk that the results start to get scary? Mm -hmm. um, you know, for most clients, you know, when we're dealing with middle class, upper middle class affluent retirees, the the capacity is almost bell shaped, right? They mm -hmm. can they take not enough risk, they might run out of money because of inflation. If they take too much risk, they right, might run out of money because bad junk can happen in the market. Right. Right. So yep. we're always trying to come up with that objective risk capacity. Mm -hmm. They need to help us figure out their psychological risk tolerance. And then the, the investment policy statement takes those two things and melds it with, okay, and here's your portfolio, and these are the objective measures of risk in your portfolio. How do we square those three things together to make sure that you understand how your investment should behave and why we need them to behave a certain way and what we expect from the portfolio that we've matched you to? Yeah. And, you know, kind of to touch on the importance of it too, Dave, for me, it's really a lot about making sure that clients understand, you know, the, the risk capacity pieces. Here's why we're doing it, right? Like, here's mm -hmm. what the plan says that we need to do. And the tolerance is more along the lines of, are you going to be able to stick with it when things get bad? Because ultimately, yeah. we know that yeah. things are going to go well sometimes, the majority of the time things are going to go poorly and being prepared for both of those is super important when you think about long-term financial planning. Right. Well, and it all, it all is underpinned by the idea that there's really no free lunch in the market. Right. 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 You, you, if you expect higher returns, you've got to take more risk to get them over time. Right. right. Just the, those things are related. If you want to expect higher returns, you have to take some form of increased risk to get them. Mm hmm. And on a side note, if somebody tells you you can get higher returns without risk, please <laughs> run away. <laughs> yes, run away, run straight to the SEC. <laughs> to, yes. um, you know, that the, we should put an asterisk on that. There are insurance vehicles out there that can absorb the risk, but let's just say there's no free lunch. There's no way to avoid the risk without paying a cost that puts you right back in the same expectation yes. as a lower risk portfolio. Right. You can Absolutely. pay to have someone else take the risk, but that's probably going to cap your mm -hmm. upside the same as if you were in a lower risk scenario to begin with. Right. So, yep. Great point. So let's peel back some of the psychological risk factors that we talk with people about. So yeah. we have um, five that we typically test. And the first one is investing confidence. Yeah. So the, so these five factors are all what, we, you know, we have a survey that we use with our clients to, to measure their risk tolerance from a company called data points. And it's, mm -hmm. it's our favorite of all of these assessments. There's lots of good ones and bad ones out there, but yeah, the first one is investing confidence because obviously the more confident you are, 
the more risk you're probably likely to take. Right. And you understand, you know, how things, well, that really, yeah. In theory, you're confident <laughs> because you understand how the markets work, right? Yeah. So there's now that can that can work against that. you. Yeah, yes. we've seen. We know that false confidence can be just as bad as low confidence, but um, in general, yes. the more confident someone scores, the higher their risk tolerance is likely to be because they at least feel they understand things. Um, right. One of the things we like about the system we use is when people score a certain metric on one of these aspects of the test, it also gives us like coaching points to help them improve, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So, you know, um, if obviously if someone scores low in investing confidence, education can sometimes help that, you know, um, yep. doing things like setting aside 30 minutes or so every week to take a look at um, Wall Street Journal articles or investment reports that uh, can help you understand what's going on. That's right. Or the Kitchen Table Finance Podcast. Well, yeah, there's always us, right? <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to get too uh, nepotistic about it, but. But yes, yeah, so a big thing in building confidence is education and, you know, it, just kind of testing your confidence and, and searching out that knowledge is really helpful if that's something you are not comfortable with. And, you know, obviously that comes with the caveat of making sure you're using reputable sources um, that are actually going to help you build that and not necessarily just picking up you know, whatever the um, news machine spits out. Um, yeah. So we can definitely, as a part of the show notes, we've got some resources that we would recommend that we'll go ahead and throw in there, some books and some different um, people that you can follow on the various social medias for that, if that's something you're interested mm -hmm. in. So then the next um, kind of uh, measurement we like to look at is volatility composure. How yeah. do you feel when the markets go haywire? Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, what I always tell people about this one too, is people make the worst financial decisions when there's the most chaos involved. Right. right. And so most right. of us by nature are, well, we're all emotional and, and most of us by nature make poor decisions as a result of those emotions. And right. this is really kind of that measurement of, how you feel about the markets, how they affect you emotionally and how that may trigger you to make a poor investment decision. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and to measure that, we're basically looking like showing people different combinations of results and saying, okay, you know, would you prefer this slow and steady um, return that doesn't add up to as much over time, but doesn't cause you as much angst in the meantime, or do you prefer, are you okay with lots of ups and downs if the end result is likely to be higher, you know, to put mm -hmm. it in a nutshell. Um, and in terms of things you can do about that, if you score low in that is, you know, set a schedule, like try not to obsess about your, your portfolio returns. And for a lot of people that means looking less, right? Yes. And, and turning and, off the news. <laughs> yeah. 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 And especially in bad times. Right. 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 Remember that the news is in the news is in the business of getting you excited and getting you to pay attention to them and watch them and not necessarily make the best financial decisions. Absolutely. And another one I like, too, that's in here is just kind of taking a look at past times of volatility and looking at in terms of the market recovery and looking at the mm -hmm. long term and looking at things that are helpful long term and not obsessing and worrying over what's happening right now and um, right. how bad things, how bad they may make things seem. Um, yeah. It's helpful to take a big picture approach when you're trying to yeah. improve kind of your volatility composure. Yeah, right on. Um, the next uh, dimension that we like to look at is a, is someone's risk personality. Like, are, are you a risk seeker or are you a stability seeker? Right. Yeah. So um, risk personality. Um, 
it can be related to, you know, how you think about investing and, and whether that's, you know, there's you're a default conservative or, or a mm-hmm. default risky person. Um, and so t- having an understanding of that really helps when we're putting together portfolios. And I guess there's a there's a pendulum with this too, right? Like if you're overly risky, that's something that we need to be wary right. of so, and have a conversation yeah. of, right? Because that yeah. comes down to like, my neighbor did, you know, 30% in XYZ stock. And I think I'm going to buy that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Without so recognizing there's an the over risk, and an under. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. With- yeah. Yeah. The risks that were involved and sure it worked out for your neighbor, but, um, and that's again, too, where that risk capacity thing comes in, right? If somebody says, Hey, I want to buy XYZ with 2% of my million dollar IRA. Well, that's one thing, Right. Right. You know, but I want to, I want to, you know, go all in on this stock. That's a whole different conversation. And, you know, sometimes it's about helping people, you know, kind of right size that risk to fit their capacity. So, yeah. So it it definitely flows both ways. You know, there's an over aggressive and then there's a too conservative. Um, And so making sure understanding who you are will really give you a good understanding of some of the things that you need to focus on or some of the things you should be concerned about when it comes to that. One of the things I really like about data points are the survey we're discussing here is that it breaks us into two parts too. There's risk personality, which is, are you in general a risk seeking or a risk avoiding person in your life? And Mm -hmm. then risk preference, which is speaking specifically about your investments. Right. And it's not uncommon for us to have Um, At least in my clientele, I've noticed a pattern where they'll score fairly low on risk personality, but because Mm -hmm. they've been longtime investors and have investing confidence, their risk preference is higher. So what I'm getting at there, they might score like a like a really conservative score. Like they're not going to like move across the country without like knowing what they're getting into. They're not going to quit a job to start a small company or something. But. They also know that while they're conservative by nature, they need to take a moderate risk in their portfolio to get the job done and they're comfortable with that. So I think that's that's one of the strong points of this particular system is we can kind of parse that. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, those things are, you know, definitely related, but um, separate. And we do see a lot of disparity in terms of, you know, those two different types of Mm -hmm. risks. And so understanding that is super helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as improving or or thinking about your risk personality, um, you know, spending a certain amount of time each month, maybe, you know, as little as 30 minutes, just kind of taking a look at your investments and making sure you're strategically invested versus speculatively invested. You want to touch on strategic oh. versus spe- 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 speculatively, Dave? Oh, yeah. You know, um, I might need a little help, you know, with that because I hadn't really thought about putting it in client terms ahead of time. But, you know, when we talk about strategic investing, you know, to me, that's, that's you know, having a coherent, well-diversified portfolio with the right amount of risk designed for that risk capacity and risk tolerance idea where speculative and, and, and that the, the mark basically, you know, when we talk about um, index funds and being diversified and just trying to, trying to match the market movements in the, you know, the broad market where speculative investing is more about picking individual investments, you know, taking Mm -hmm. large risks on individual things, that may or may not pay off and have very large consequences in either direction. Yeah. So to, to give you a real life example of something that I used to do very early on in my career, um, I would take, I would take my 401k and I would look at all the things that did absolutely terrible the year before. And that's where I would invest. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times that paid off because typically, you know, what was last year's loser is next year's winner. Mm-hmm. But right. over a long period of time, having a divor- diversified strategy, more than likely, I didn't track it, but would have the <laughs> same level of returns with probably way less risk. Yeah. Well, um, even so, 
you know, an argument could be made for the approach you were taking as opposed to, I think, I think one, one way to put it is that when we're dealing with speculation, in my view, you're really dealing with luck, right? Yeah. Where mm-hmm. even, even while I wouldn't, and you, you wouldn't go back to that approach you took early in your career with, you know, picking the underperformers necessarily, at least that was a systemic approach to the market. And those were still broadly diversified investments, right? That's true. It wasn't yeah. like you were saying, hey, I'm going to go buy GameStop stock with, you know, my entire 401k. Right. You know, so that's that's kind of where, where I see that being different. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times in investing, we say just about any strategy can work. The key is to have a strategy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're still going to be further ahead than not having a strategy, even if it's a mediocre strategy. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Great point. So another thing you can do as far as um, assessing and improving your risk personality is just set a time each week to kind of challenge some negative thoughts and worries you have about the risk in your portfolio and just kind of looking yeah. at, and again, going back to researching and looking at long-term market trends and not mm-hmm. necessarily focusing on the short term. Mm-hmm. And, um, and talk to, talk to your advisor, you know, keep things yeah. in context. I always think that's the most important thing we do market wise during client reviews is not so much, you know, where we think things are going. It's more about, Hey, here's what happened. And just so you kind of understand the context, because that's going to help you going forward to be able to shrug off some of the downside times and understand that you know, markets are cyclical and we do deal with, have to deal with downside as part of the, part of the equation. Yeah, that's a great point. And a lot of what we're doing right now in our um, client review meetings is really related to this idea of here's an understanding of, you know, we have our slide of what's, what's going well and what we're concerned about. And we kind of talk about what's happening in the markets and then the last couple of slides that we've been sharing with clients are my favorite. And one of them is the diversification chart and the power of diversification. Mm-hmm. And then the, the other one is kind of the long-term outlook, what the market's done since the pre-2008 financial crisis and, and basically yeah. taking that yeah. huge hit in the very beginning. And then the 2020, 2022 drops and we're still seeing that long-term investing has paid out very, very well, despite all those bad things that have happened in the last 16 years. And and that's where people's focus should be on what the long-term results are, not necessarily what's going on in the markets today. Right. So all all of this kind of comes to a head with the, with the um, dimension of judgment, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there we're looking at, okay, you know, taking all of these emotional things, your your risk capacity, I mean, your risk tolerance and how you feel about the market and whether you're a risk seeking personality, what do you do about it when the market's lousy and you're feeling bad about it? Do you act on that? Mm-hmm. And it's not uncommon, again, back to folks with more experience and more education to say, I'm really conservative, but I, I, I know that I can turn my back on this and walk away from it and trust you guys to, you know, see me through it a few years from now. Absolutely. And just that importance of, you know, as you're focused on the short term or the long term mm-hmm. and understanding that if you're more short term focused, that's where the pressure is going to be to make changes, even though it may not be in your best interest as far as your long term right. planning. Right. So, um, you know, sticking with a regular review schedule and looking at things, not just in the light of market performance, but in terms of what that means for your long-term goals, think of the ways to improve judgment. Yeah. One of the, the tools that I really like that we use with clients is kind of the, um, we can actually go into their financial plan and say, Hey, here's what happens if we have a down market based on your portfolio. Right. Yeah. And most of the time it does 
affect them, but not, not nearly as much in terms of their plan outcome as they probably are thinking, right? And so yeah. that's just kind of a helpful tool to get them to take that long term. Here's what it really means to your plan over the next 20 years versus what it means to your portfolio over the next two months. Right, right. So... And then our last item that we measure as a part of this is action. Um, so how might you react as far as if we have a market where there's volatility? Will you sell? Will you hold? Will you buy? Where do you fall mm -hmm. in that kind of spectrum of what kind of action you might take? Yeah. Yeah. And because the last thing we want when at the end of the day is to set someone up with a portfolio that's more aggressive than they're comfortable with. So it has more volatility. And all of a sudden we're in a market like last spring where we're down 15%, 16%. And they're calling up and saying, you got to just get me out of this. Mm -hmm. Because then we're never going to make up that um, loss. Right. Right. And I would rather have you, I would rather have that discussion up front and have you in a portfolio where maybe you're down, but you're not down that bad. Have that up front and not be trying to make big returns. Just accept the fact we're going to be conservative than having you try to make big returns when the market's doing well and cut losses when things are doing poorly because we're never going to get that right. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such an important conversation to have before you start investing, and especially, you know, in working with an advisor around what does this mean in terms of, you know, if my what, what will my portfolio do? And really even breaking it down to like a dollar amount, like we said earlier, if this, you know, if you have a $500,000 portfolio and the loss is 50,000, how are you feeling about that? What is it, you know, and start to visualize that because ultimately like we know, those things are going to happen. We're going to have periods where the market doesn't do well. And the more you're prepared for it on the front end, the better you'll do when that actually happens, right? Right, right. And, and so super important to not only kind of get these scores, but also understand what they mean as you're putting a portfolio together so yeah. that you're prepared for it as opposed to surprised and doing things differently um, or taking action when you should be kind of holding steady. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So important topic. And uh, there's a lot of different uh, nuances to it, for sure. Absolutely. Um, so I think from here, Dave, we will put those show notes together. And I believe that we can even put a... Um, investor profile quiz in there for our listeners in the show notes sure. in case they want to take it and kind of assess their own risk tolerance. We will throw that in the show notes as well, a link to that if you want to see what your own risk tolerance would be using our system that we use data points. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. And as always, if our listeners have questions about this topic or anything else, feel free to shoot us an email at info at srbadvisors.com. Great. Thank you, Nick. Been a pleasure, Dave.